keep everything on time. As you can imagine, there's a lot of pressure to keep this on time today. My name's Shannon Allen, I'm president of the Milwaukee Bar Association, and my remarks are very short. I'd like to introduce John D'Amato, who will be the moderator today. Well, I am Judge John D'Amato. I've served as the judicial facilitator for this judicial forum for the past probably 10 or 15 years, and it's a pleasure to be here once again. First of all, I want to thank the Milwaukee Bar Association for putting on this judicial forum. They were at the forefront of doing a forum about 25 years ago, um, and they've continued to do so. And they've continued to do so because they understand the need for an informed electorate. And by doing this, it gives people an opportunity to upfront see the candidates and to submit questions uh, for the candidates. Um, I would also like to thank the Wisconsin Justice Initiative. They've been very supportive of the Milwaukee Bar Association in terms of today's forum. Um, I also want to thank the media outlets that are here. We have a number of media outlets. We really need you to be able to get out the word to people who are unable to be here because it's important that we have an informed electorate. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the three candidates for the uh, seat on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Well, we have the Milwaukee County Circuit Court Judge Rebecca Dowd, we have South County Circuit Court Judge Michael Spenick, and we have Madison Attorney Tim Burns. Uh, they are the three candidates. And of course, the primary is coming up on Tuesday, February 20th. Before I explain briefly uh, the format that we're going to use here today, I want to recognize uh, and introduce those judges who are from Milwaukee County uh, who are on the ballot this spring. They are all running unopposed. Uh, but they're uh, appreciative of all the help and work that the Milwaukee Bar Association has done for our judiciary. Uh, for the Court of Appeals District 1, we have Timothy Dugan. If you're here, Tim, you can stand up. Um, for the Circuit Court, we have Judge William Sosny, Judge Carolina Stark, Judge Joseph Wall, Judge Mark Sanders, Judge Jeffrey Wagner, Judge Marshall Murray, Judge Jane Carroll and Judge Lindsey Grady. Now, Judge Grady and Judge Carroll uh, were unable to be here. Uh, they got tied up at Children's Court and are unable to be here today, uh, but uh, they send their regrets. Now, in terms of the judicial format for this forum's format, each candidate is going to be given two minutes to make an opening statement. Um, before we began this proceeding, uh, we did a drawing in terms of who goes first, in terms of opening statement, closing, arguments and in terms of uh, questions. Um, you will have an opportunity to submit written questions on the edge of each table. There's a pen and uh, pieces of paper. If you have a question, write it out, raise your hand. Someone from the Milwaukee Bar Association will pick it up, give it to me. I vet the questions because it's important that the questions be addressed to all three candidates. You don't just submit a question for one candidate. Um, but our two moderators, uh, Shannon Sims and Charles Benson from uh, TMJ4, they will decide which of the questions that will be uh, asked. Uh, we also have a timekeeper because each uh, of the candidates gets two minutes to answer each question. They'll be given a one minute warning and a five second warning. Um, and then uh, finally, each of the candidates will be given two minutes to make their closing statements. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce the two moderators, Charles Benson and uh, Shannon Sims. They're both reporters and news anchors at TMJ4. They co-host 41 Forward, where they tackle really important and timely issues uh, here in Wisconsin. We're honored to have them with us, and so I introduce uh, Charles Benson and Shannon Sims. Thank you for having us here today. We'll only, we will only take about an hour to introduce ourselves. And, uh, I know you're here for another important reason, so we will begin with uh, the candidates are, who are here, and we'll begin with the opening statements. All right, thank you. And thank you to the Milwaukee Bar and the Wisconsin Justice Initiative for this opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, I am a mom, I am an experienced judge, and I'm an experienced attorney, and I am running for Wisconsin Supreme Court. We are at a time right now where our rights are under attack, our values, things like clean air and water, equal protection under the law, women are under attack, and we have a Supreme Court that's broken. One of the symptoms of that broken court is the special interest money that has come into these races 
to elect to buy justice or a justice. And in the John Doe case, when that special interest money was sitting right in front of the court in the form of a party that had spent $2.25 million on Justice Gableman's election, he refused to recuse himself. And then the court shut down the very investigation that John Doe was about, which was about the coordination of that special interest money and politics, something we should all care about. Just this past spring, my colleagues put forward a petition in front of the Supreme Court to have a meaningful recusal rule, one that would give people confidence in our court. The Supreme Court refused to even hold a hearing on that recusal rule. And then the court shut down the very rule hearings that used to be open, that used to be transparent. We need to restore confidence in our courts and trust in our leaders. I have been working in our Wisconsin courts my entire career. Over 20 years, I've been dedicated to public service as a prosecutor, now as a judge, both protecting the vulnerable, upholding the law, and that is what I would continue to do on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. begin by thanking the uh, Milwaukee Bar Association for hosting this event and uh, Mr. Benson and Ms. Sims for moderating. Most of all, I want to thank you, the voters, for sharing, uh, showing an interest in a race that uh, unfortunately far too often flies under the radar. I am Michael Screnock and I am running for the Wisconsin Supreme Court because I care deeply about Wisconsin and about the rule of law. You know, I was born and raised here, I went to school here. I raised my family here and I've dedicated my professional life to serving the people of this great state. Now I am a judge and I know firsthand the importance of the court upholding the rule of law, protecting public safety, and respecting the Constitution and the separation of powers. I have served as an attorney and I know the dangers of a court legislating from the bench. Judges are not legislators, nor are we executives. Our job is to interpret and apply the law as written, based not on our personal or political beliefs, but based on the statutes and the Constitution. Simply put, our job is to be arbiters of the law, not policy analysts or political activists. Now, as you'll hear this afternoon, my opponents do not share these views. One of them has called the notion of an impartial judiciary a fairy tale. The other has ridiculed my commitment to the rule of law and called it garbage. Both of them are actively campaigning on the political issues that they hold dear, and I find this practice deeply troubling. An independent judiciary comprised of justices with an unwavering commitment to upholding the rule of law, recognizing and respecting the separation of powers, and interpreting the Constitution as it was originally intended is critical to maintaining and preserving our democracy and our republic. Citizens all across the Badger State deserve the security and predictability of an independent, nonpartisan Supreme Court. And by electing me to the bench this spring, that is exactly what they will get. Thank you. I'm Tim Burns, and I'm a progressive lawyer who believes in a legal system that protects our democracy and the rights of regular people, regardless of income, regardless of race. I grew up in an America in which a kid like me, the grandson of Mississippi sharecroppers, still could get ahead. Despite my shaky voice, I've become one of the top lawyers in the country at advocating for insurance purchasers. I've brought huge class actions for regular people to keep the insurance industry in check. My practice touches every aspect of the American economy, from the car that you drive, to the bank where you put your savings, to the life insurance that you purchase to protect your family. 
I've also been hired by many large manufacturers, banking, and investment companies to handle their most serious problems. Clients seek me out because they know that I know America, America's business backwards and forwards, inside and out. Our country is on a knife edge right now. Concentrated corporate wealth has weakened our democracy and working people are hurting. It has to stop. It's not time to turn over the next seat on the high court to a cog in the machinery of mass incarceration in the city or a cog in Scott Walker's efforts to do the Koch brothers bidding. I'm Tim Burns. I'm not seeking a promotion. I'm leaving a job I love because sometimes it takes a fresh look to get us back on track. Uh, the first question will go to Judge Strenna. Uh All three will get a chance to answer, but you'll answer first. Uh, I want to get to judicial philosophy. I want to get it uh, to it in the context of what's come up in the race. Uh, as you know, Judge Daly has been running uh, a TV ad uh, with President Trump saying that civil rights are being violated. And I want to ask you in the context of your judicial philosophy, if you are approached with cases dealing with civil rights, how will you approach those? to your philosophy. Thank you. As I said in my opening statement, the role of the court is to in interpret and apply the law based on the written text of the statutes and based on the original public meaning of our Constitution. And so when we talk about civil rights concerns, frequently you're talking about government action that infringes upon the rights that are guaranteed to the people through our Bill of Rights, uh, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. It is absolutely the role of the court uh, to, uh, to enforce those rights and to pull tightly on the reins of government when either the legislature or the executive branch have exceeded the constitutional boundaries that are set, the boundaries of authority that are set by our Constitution. Where I think I differ from my two opponents is that I believe strongly that we determine what those rights are based on the original public meaning of the Constitution as it was understood at the time it was either adopted or amended. And why that's important is because what I, what I believe uh, is not the role of the court. It's not the role of the court to change the constitutional boundaries on a case-by-case -case basis. Our Constitution is not an amorphous document. It doesn't grow and shrink and shift and change based on the proclivities or the desires or wishes of individual justices in any given case. We know what the Constitution means based on, the, based on its original public meaning. Now, that doesn't mean that it's a dead document or that it's irrelevant. What we do is, as a, as a court, you need to look at precedent. You need to look at how the constitutional provisions have been determined in the past, how they've been applied. Follow that trajectory and apply it to new phenomena to the extent that it's a question of first impression. But it is not the role of the court to invent new rights or to reinterpret the Constitution to create new rights. Judge Dell. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? So getting to judicial philosophy, your campaign commercial referring to uh, civil rights being violated, how will you apply your philosophy when approached with cases concerning civil rights? So my judicial philosophy is certainly to uphold the rule of law. Um, I think, well, I know that I'm the only candidate in this race who knows what that means and who does that on a daily basis, and I've been doing that for more than 10 years. Um, applying, the rule, applying the rule of law means the, what the legislature has given us, but it also means the court is there to make sure that if rights are violated, that the court is there to, to protect those rights. So it is not a rubber stamp of the legislature, which is what I believe that Judge Skrenek would, at the position that he would take, and that he has taken throughout this campaign, having worked for our governor, having been working also for the Republican Party, and having stated that he believes that uh, Justice Gableman is someone that uh, he emulates, and someone who, in the John Doe case, as I started out by talking about, the court did not 
uh, they actually did legislate from the bench. And I think what when he refers to my criticism of him of legislating from the bench, that is something that the conservative court has done as well, and something that Judge Skrenak does not understand that it can come from either side of the court. And in that John Doe case, the legislature, uh, the uh, case in front of the court was one that the court could have, should have gone on with an investigation. And the only reason for shutting down that investigation was to do the bidding of political allies. And that is what Judge Skrenak intends to do. Uh, Mr. Burns has never been an a judge. He does not know what it's like to apply the law and wants to insert his beliefs into the cases. I'm the only one that knows what it's like every day to apply that law, but to also understand the importance of the role of a court. Our Constitution is one that our founding fathers had a vision for, and it was not stuck in the moment of 1787 when, when women couldn't vote, when African Americans were treated as less than whole people. We are at a place where we need to make sure that our Constitution is there to protect all of our rights, and that's something that I would conti continue to do. Thank you. Mr. Burns. So, um, I want to go back to the first part of your question about Judge Dallas Trump ad before moving on to the second part of your question. What that really shows is that Judge Dallas will say whatever it takes to get elected. When we started this campaign last spring, Judge Dallas talked about not politicizing the judiciary. This summer, she said the candidates shouldn't mention um, Scott Walker and Donald Trump. But when polling showed that she had no path to success, suddenly the first campaign ad we get shows Donald Trump in its first frame with an attack on Donald Trump. Don't get me wrong, I don't mind attacks on Donald Trump. What I don't like are candidates who will say anything to be elected. Now getting to the second part of the question about judicial philosophy. Here's my, my judicial philosophy in a nutshell. Give democracy as much leeway as possible, but when it interferes with the rights under the Constitution, Constitution of regular people, courts are there to put a check on it. The problem with Judge Skrenak's conservative judicial philosophy is that it doesn't take away any of the leeway judges have. It just empowers conservative judges to do things like invalidate the Voting Rights Act in the Shelby County versus Holder case, invalidate the um, Violence Against Women's Act in the United States versus Morrison case, and invalidate portions of the American with Disabilities Act. Let's not get ourselves. All judges decide what the law is. Some lead us down a wrong path. Are we permitted to respond? No? No. Okay. I'll, I'll do it in the next question. All right. So. I'll keep in that partisan theme. Uh, in an opinion piece uh, with the Wisconsin State Journal, quote, judicial elections are turning the state's best judges into the worst politicians. If you are viewed as a conservative, a moderate, a liberal, or a progressive, will you then be expected to use that in your judicial philosophy? And Mr. Burns, I believe, is the first to respond to that. Sure. Look, I've talked a lot in this campaign about killing the fairy tale that judges are non-political. I think we all understand it, or most of us understand it at a gut level. There's some lawyers and some judges uh, who seem very hard to get the point across to. But when you think about Social Security, the minimum wage, the maximum work pay, unemployment compensation, affordable health care, voting rights, these were five to four decisions in the U.S. Supreme Court along political lines. The cornerstones of our middle class democracy came down to one vote along political lines. Well, let's stop kidding ourselves because kidding ourselves and believing in the fairy tale is what has allowed 
the right wing in this country to take over our judiciary. They preach this, this talk of judges as umpire, which patently is false. And then they get on the bench and they invalidate the Violence Against Women Act. Judges have a political role. So to respond to Mr. Burns and also to answer the question, I have had the same message throughout my entire campaign from day one. From day one, I have understood that we judges can and should talk about our values. And I have been talking about my values from my very announcement speech of my campaign. And I am the only one sitting at this table who shares Wisconsin values, ones that, that I know how to make sure are protected in our courts. I have never changed that message. And I have also never changed the message that we all need to understand that our courts need to be fair and impartial. I can talk about values, things like caring about clean air and water, our public schools, women's rights, and I understand that we cannot take positions on cases that are going to come before the court. Positions like Mr. Burns has taken throughout the entire campaign. What position? I, what position? I, this is my time, Mr. Burns. Mr. Burns has carried out a campaign where he has taken positions on issues, issues that will come before the court. He has done it on his Twitter feed. He has done it from day one. I get that he doesn't understand what it means to be a judge because he isn't one. I get that he doesn't know when you're a judge, you don't get to pick and choose one fact here and one fact there in order to make that fit your rhetoric, what your message is. That is exactly what he's done throughout the entire campaign. He has called me a racist based on some facts from a case. He has basically criticized my commitment to my own campaign while leaving out the fact that I've got 2,000 individual donors. He's talked about my upbringing, part of it that he knows nothing about, and that is how he has conducted his campaign. What we need on our court is a judge, a judge who knows how to be fair and impartial to look at all the facts, and that's something you learn and you practice, and I've been doing it for 10 years, over 10,000 cases. That's a fantastic question, and I'm glad that you asked it. It's really very important that the voters understand where the three of us, view, how we view uh, the court's role as it relates to uh, the political issues that we hold dear and to the personal feelings that we have about cases. Uh, I'm actually I'm, I'm surprised uh, I wasn't expecting this when I went into this campaign that uh, one of the primary attacks against my fitness for the bench is that I was an excellent attorney when I was in private practice. Um, I did work on very important cases that had statewide impact and, uh, and they're well known and I don't need to tick through them. But I am now a judge and what I understand is that the role of a judge is very different from the role of an advocate. Now, I have experience that goes beyond uh, either of my two opponents, and that is before I was an attorney, I worked in local government. And so I've worked on the issues, I worked on, I've wrestled with this tension between private interests on the one hand, society's interests on the other hand, as those uh, societal interests are reflected through government regulation. I wrestled with it for the first nearly 12 years on the side of local government, helping city councils and mayors understand the limits of their lawful authority and then helping them to accomplish their goals within the context of that authority. As an attorney in private practice, most of my work was done on the side on behalf of private interests that were interacting with government. And so I wrestled with that same tension from the side of private interests. As a judge, my fidelity is to the law and to the law alone. Now to get to your question, uh, the role of a justice, I believe strongly, is to set aside whatever personal beliefs you have about an issue and decide the case only on the law and on the, and on the uh, facts. And it takes incredible strength of character to do that. It takes integrity. We have justices on our state Supreme Court and on our US Supreme Court that are not clones of each other. They have different personalities. What I can commit to the people of Wisconsin is that I understand the importance of setting aside those personal beliefs and deciding a case solely on the law as it comes to me. Judge Allen, I think you'll answer this, uh, be the first. I want to get to your decision-making process, how you make decisions, and put it within the context 
uh, the illegal gun. Big, big issue, illegal guns in Milwaukee with strong views about the number of illegal weapons. Outside of Milwaukee, big Second Amendment right issue. So when it comes to state laws, when you apply your decision-making abilities and are confronted with cases about state laws on this, how would you approach it? Well, I'm confronted with state laws every day, and the way to approach it is to look at the law itself and to determine, based on that law, whether or not um, it is violating someone's rights. I mean, that is that is the very heart of what we're talking about here. Um, as I stated earlier, I think that the rule of law is very important, and when criticized by uh, Judge Screnock about my comments that I made to that, those comments related to Again, what that means. Um, Judge Scranton gave a very good example on when he was describing what it means to be a judicial activist on one of on Wisconsin Public Radio, and that was basically that when you have a law in front of you, that you follow that law and that you not try to lead to an end result that you're trying to get to. The problem that we have right now is that we have a court that is leading to an end result and not applying the law. The end result that was led to in John Doe, Act 10, the way it was analyzed, did not analyze the very right that was at issue in that case, which was the right to association. The court instead chose to get to an end result. And the fact that Judge Scranach doesn't understand that is concerning. That's what judicial activism is. On the other hand, I have Mr. Burns, who is basically telling you that he will do whatever he believes democracy dictates. Democracy has to do with three branches of government. It has to do with our legislature, our governor, and our courts. We are limited in our courts by what is put in front of us, and we don't get to just do what democracy dictates the way a legislator would. We step in when rights are being violated. I'm the only one that understands this in this race, and I'm the only one that is trying to continually keep the politics out of it, recognizing our rights are under attack, recognizing values are important, and still, we need a court that is keeping politics at bay for everyone. Judge Scranach, and I am trying to get to your, describing your decision-making capabilities on these issues. The issue of guns is certainly one that has um, great emotion, and I, and I think you hit on both, well, two different camps. It was interesting to me when I was in law school, I. While I was in law school, I went through hunter safety with uh, my, our oldest son on one of the weekends when I went back to Washburn. I was commuting from Washburn to Madison for law school for two years. And when I came back, I was talking with one of my um, fellow students who's from the Milwaukee area. And it, the discussion we had fascinated me because she could not wrap her mind around the notion that my wife and I had bought our teenage son a shotgun for his birthday. And she didn't say shotgun, she said a gun. You know, how could you buy your son a gun? And growing up in Baraboo, in rural Wisconsin, living at that time up in Bayfield uh, <coughs> County, the question seemed odd, because that's what folks do in rural Wisconsin. When their kids grow up, they learn how to hunt, and they get a gun. And they don't use it to shoot people, they don't use it to rob um, gas stations. They use it to go hunting, and they're taught uh, how to respectfully operate a gun and to do it safely. But what that conversation really highlighted to me is, are these two different camps, uh, Mr. Benson, that you're talking about, in terms of the views of guns. Now, in my decision-making process, um, what I do, is, is what I've described before, is that when a complex question comes before me, I do the research, and I go where the law leads me. I don't decide. Judge Dallas, right. I don't decide how I want the case to come out first and then find a path to it. Um, and so questions of uh, Second Amendment rights come up in various different contexts. They can be complex. And I believe you, when you do the research and you identify what the Constitution allows and then determine whether any particular law un, unduly infringes on those rights, you can come to an, to an answer. But I, again, I, I don't come to the answer first and then find the path. I do the research and go where the law takes me. Mr. Burns. So what um here's an example that I think both um Judge Gallat and Judge Scrinnick um they get it wrong. 
The consequences for violation of the law are not irrelevant to a decision about what the law is. It's not irrelevant. Because you have to start with an understanding of what the law's purpose is and what was intended by the law, by the people who wrote the law. Because judges, in most circumstances, are trying to put into effect the will of the people through the legislature. But that doesn't mean you ignore consequences, because consequences tell you whether what happened is consistent with the legislative purpose in passing the law. For example, well, I grew up with grunt guns, uh, and I have a lot of respect for the historic right in this country to own guns and to, um, for hunting purposes and for home protection um, purposes. That doesn't mean that I want guns on school buses. It doesn't mean that I want guns on airplanes. It doesn't mean that I want guns on buses like recently happened in Madison. In order to decide what the, um, the Constitutional Convention meant when it determined the Second Amendment or the liberty interests of the 14th Amendment or a statute pertaining to guns, you have to look at what the consequences are going to be. And I guarantee you that no one thought the consequences of having guns would be huge level of person on person violence and people shooting up schools. Thank you. I'm going to take a question from the audience. And this is for all three. Do you think that implicit racial bias exists in the Wisconsin court system? If so, what can be done about it? And the first one to respond, I believe, would be Judge Scrinnick, please. Thank you. I believe that implicit racial bias exists in all of us at, at different levels, and judges are not immune from it. It's an issue. I can tell you that it's an issue that in our uh, Wisconsin judicial system, uh, the court system is doing its best to educate judges about uh, implicit bias and uh, how it can infect the decisions that we make, as well as giving us uh, tools and uh, tips that we can use to try to limit the impact of implicit bias in our decision making, and also to be alert, particularly when we're dealing uh, with uh, jury, the jury selection process, to <coughs> try to be alert and see where perhaps uh, it may be sneaking into the minds of the jurors as well, because it's, it's critically important that we have jurors that reach the right results based on their discussions and not based on any, any bias that they bring into the court to the extent that it can be identified. Um, the difficulty, though, is that uh, we cannot stop doing the work that we do in court. And so as judges get more and more uh, trained on the realities of implicit bias, the, uh, the impact that, that that reality can have on our decision-making process, uh, the more we learn about that and the more we get trained on it, the better a job we can do to set it aside. Um, what I've also found, and I've observed this in my courtroom, is that there can be individuals who are looking for evidence of that bias, whether it's actually there or not. And, uh, and I don't have a solution for that, but I think it's important for all of us, um, no matter what our background is, to take people, to begin with the notion of taking people at face value and don't come into an, an interaction, whether it's a courtroom or anywhere else, expecting that someone has it out for you because of your color or your ethnicity or your background or something like that. Yes. Implicit bias absolutely exists. We have proof of that. We have evidence of that. And I uh, am one of the leaders in our court system in making sure to help to educate other judges. I am currently an associate dean of our Wisconsin Judicial College. We are charged with the responsibility of training and teaching and helping our fellow judges from across the state both judges that have been there for a long time and new judges to learn about things like implicit bias, to be, understand how it affects us 
and how it affects our decision making, how it affects our cases and our courtrooms. Um, and I have been a, t a teacher as well throughout our state and issues involving our criminal justice system for years. Um, I also teach nationwide with respect to domestic violence and power and control and trying to break those cycles. Um, I take a lot of, I believe it's a responsibility that we have as judges and justices to learn the most we can about our system, to do the best we can, to educate ourselves and to make it better every day. And I've been involved in the community in that way, doing the hard work every day, um, not just for campaign purposes, but over the last 20 years, attending uh, conferences like community brainstorming, being parts of panels, trying to educate myself and pass that knowledge on to my fellow judges and making it so we can do better in our court system, which we absolutely need to do. So um, you will all understand where this question came from, right? So a week ago, Judge Mike Brennan, formerly of this county's court, was um, at his confirmation hearing in the U.S. Senate uh, to sit on the Seventh Circuit. And he was asked that same question. And he refused to answer because of, according to what he said, the code of ethics or the code uh, canon of judicial conduct prevented him from happening. So I am very glad that we have come to a place in this campaign where people at least provide an answer to that question. And in my view, our 400 year history in this country guarantees us that implicit bias is present in everything we do and we have to be conscious of it. But unlike what Judge Dallet was talking about, it is just not enough to talk the talk. Judge Dowd accuse me, accuses me of cherry picking her cases by bringing up the case Wisconsin versus Dickens, which the press described as standing while black subjects you to search. Look, we have to all be conscious of these cases. We have people who were fundamentally de denied their civil rights in this country for years, but it isn't just the Dickens case. Judge Dowd also decided the Brown case again, that was reversed by the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court where a broken headlight she thought was sufficient to subject someone to search. And the Pew case were turning their body the wrong way subjected someone to search. Look, we have to do more than talk to the talk. We have to walk the walk. I want to bring up campaign funding and recusal in the same topic here. And as you know, justices don't have to disclose why they recuse themselves from specific cases. I want to ask you, what would go into your decision if you have to recuse yourself from a case, how transparent you would be? And I want to put it in the context of a number of retired judges recently filed a petition with the court seeking a change in a rule that justices could not decide a case when one of the parties or attorneys gave $10,000 or more to the justice. Your thoughts with Mr. Burns going first. Well, I'm a supporter of the former judge's uh, rules petition uh, with the uh, rule that Supreme Court justices will not sit on cases in which they've received a benefit of more than $10,000. Um, in terms of my own um, decision making with respect to recusal. Look, folks, our politics are already up for sale in this country. What we've shown in Wisconsin is our judiciary is up for sale too. And I want that to um, end, period. In terms of my decision making, if a party asks me to recuse from a case, I will treat it like other cases. I will take the issue seriously and uh, read their briefs, make a decision, and be absolutely transparent in my decision making. Like I've been in this campaign, the per 
purpose of my campaign was to get us to a point of requiring candor of judicial candidates about their values because we all know those values impact our lives. That's right. All right. Thank you. I think it's important um, for everyone around the state to realize a couple of things about recusal. First of all, we have a recusal rule in Wisconsin and people shouldn't be confused about that or misled into thinking that we do not have a rule. The recusal rule requires a judge or a justice to consider in every single case whether there's a reason why that uh, individual cannot uh, be fair and impartial in the case. And it can cover any number of reasons. Uh, it can come from uh, a personal belief about the issue in the case that's so strong uh, that you cannot you believe you cannot be fair and impartial. It can come from a primary, or a previous relationship as, a, as an attorney working for the client, or in, and in particular, if you worked with the client on that matter, you're required to recuse yourself uh, to get out of the case. And a campaign contribution or assistance during the campaign can be something that can rise to that level as well. And this is not a new issue for Wisconsin. This, this issue was front and center nine years ago when then Chief Justice Abrahamson uh, was in her re-election bid and she had received some substantial contributions from attorneys and, and her challenger, her opponent challenged her to articulate publicly that she would recuse herself from any cases that involve those attorneys. And she said, no, I'm not going to make that blanket statement. She said, we have a rule that requires a judge or a justice to consider all of the circumstances of the case. Now, I did, not, I did not support the, um, the petition that was filed for the specific rule for a number of reasons. There are serious First Amendment uh, concerns involved in the fact that we have an elected judiciary and that we have judicial elections. And I do not think that people should be stifled from participating in, in elections over an arbitrary rule that sets a limit that would cause them to sit out this campaign season out of concern that, that a justice would not serve on a case. All right, I'm going to take you off the bench for just a oh, second. I didn't get oh, an answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, as far as the recusal rule goes, the fact that Judge Scranach can say we have any kind of recusal rule, yeah, it's a rule you're supposed to get yourself off of cases where it looks like you're not fair. Justice Gableman had $2.25 million spent on his campaign, not by an attorney, by a party sitting right in front of him on the case, and he didn't take himself off. We do not have a meaningful recusal rule. That is the first thing. Then to respond to Mr. Burns, it is absolute cherry picking and it is a total lack of understanding of the job of a judge. First of all, you tell parts of cases and the title to that article was compliments of you, Mr. Burns. Yes, I get you've called me a racist. The response in our community, my community where I sit, was for, for, just, uh, for Senator Taylor to stand by me and introduce me at the Women's March, for Senator LaTanya Johnson to issue a press release, and for the community to, who knows me and knows the hard work that I do every day in this community to stand by me. You would like to take a couple facts out of a case and disregard the rest of them. The fact of a violent felon, the fact that the, that the uh, police believed he possessed a illegal firearm, which by the way, he did. The other case that you mentioned, you should do your homework before you start talking to people about because the United States Supreme Court has affirmed my decision in that case and it's no longer good law. A case came down right after that case and, and it was decided eight to one so we have many justices, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Justice Kagan, who all ruled that a mistake of law regarding a broken tail light is not a ba it can be a basis for a search, as I ruled on that day. We talk about candor. I am the one who is open. This is my record, and it's open because I'm a judge, and it's open to the public. You have yet to tell anyone how many cases you have ever had in a Wisconsin courtroom, how many criminal, how many jury trials. We can assume those answers. We can guess. We don't even know who your clients are. So this candor is something to pull, fit into your political rhetoric again, and not the truth. OK. So now I'm going to ask a question that Hopefully, you will only answer pertaining to yourself. 
what is the most difficult decision you have ever made in your life? Not on the bench. What is the most difficult decision you have ever made in your life? And Judge Dallant, you get to go first. So some of those are very private decisions um, in terms of difficult decisions <laughs> I've made in my life. Um, I mean, my, I would say I will give two answers. I will give a vague answer regarding the fact that being a mom is a tough job, as anyone here who is one knows, and that sometimes there are decisions that you have to make that break your heart. And you do the best you can for your kids, and I'm going to leave it, that's probably in my life my truly most difficult decisions that, thank God, uh, have turned out well and terrific. And I have three terrific kids. Um, but I do think it's important to talk about being a judge and the difficulty of that because again I think that's something you can't possibly know until you do it day in and day out and I'm not talking about for a year or two I'm talking about for 10 years I'm talking about having the kind of cases that break your heart the second you hear them the things I have seen and heard are things and I know my colleagues understand this are things that no one should have to see and hear I could tell stories of terrible things people have done to each other and I've had to look someone in the eye and sentence them to life in prison. And that is not easy. Even if they have killed multiple people and really, truly, you know that's the best thing to do. So I would say the toughest things to do are to be a judge, to actually deal with the people, the problems that come in front of you on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's, again, that's why we need experience on this court. We need someone who's had to make those tough calls, who doesn't sit back and pick out little pieces and parts of over 10,000 cases I've decided, hundreds that have been affirmed on appeal, and try to say that that says something about the job I do as a judge every day. The tough thing is actually making those decisions in that moment with the information you have, the best information you have, all you have in front of you in that moment. So, many of her toughest decisions in life are personal decisions, but my toughest public decision in life has been running the campaign that I have run for the Wisconsin Supreme Court. It occurred to me once or twice before I decided to run an openly and aggressively progressive campaign for the Wisconsin Supreme Court that it would not be viewed favorably by judges and it would not be viewed favorably by many lawyers because fairy tales die hard. But I decided to do it because ultimately, I believe in democracy, I believe in voters, and I believe if voters are going to elect or acquiesce in the appointment of judges, it is incumbent in a democracy that the judges are candid about their political values because we all know those values impact decisions. It's easy to be a centrist in the world. There's a lot of comfort in the center. There's a lot of comfort in the idea that we can work well with our Republican neighbors and get along and have a peaceful democracy. But the center doesn't work after 40 years of one side setting out to over-concentrate wealth in this country and to destroy our democracy. So I made the tough decision to leave part-time, a job that I love and that um, I will miss, to run for this position. I don't know that I've ever thought of it in, in the context of being a tough decision, but I think some of the most important decisions I've made, uh, Mr. Burns touched on it a little bit, uh, have been my, my decisions as to my various uh, professions that I've pursued. Uh, I have an MBA, and by the time I completed my MBA, we had one son, and another uh, was coming soon. We have three boys right now. 
And I decided, I made the, the conscious decision with my wife, we decided together that I was not going to pursue um, work within uh, private business, but would uh, take my talents uh, to the public service. And I ended up in local government. That's what that began my odyssey in local government. Um, because of the roles that I took, I, I moved my family around the state um, a couple of different times. And that impacted our kids and where they went to school, and they had to move and change <coughs> friends. And that was, those were not light, lightly, uh, those were not decisions we came to lightly. Uh, at some point, my wife and I decided I would go back to law school and pursue my passion for the law. And that had an incredibly disrupting impact on our family. Uh, and then I, I selected uh, Michael Best and Friedrich, we selected each other. Uh, I decided to uh, practice law there. That caused us to move back towards the Madison area. And again, our kids had to change schools. I then decided to leave that practice, which was comfortable and lucrative and uh, very enjoyable, uh, to return to public service to serve my hometown as a circuit court judge, basically jumping without a net. Uh, I got a gubernatorial appointment. I had to stand for election the very next spring. There was no promise that I would uh, survive that spring election, and we had no backup. And then this decision to run for this race has, it, as you can imagine, has had an enormous effect on our family, both my wife and our children. And uh, I don't come to those decisions lightly, but I do it because I believe strongly in using my talents in service to the public, and I would be honored to serve the entire state of Wisconsin from this most important position on the Supreme Court. So we had promised we'd keep everybody here for about an hour, getting close to that one hour before we get to your closing statement. So, I have one other simple question for you, and I think we're going to give you one minute because we think you can answer this one in one minute. And it uh, basically this: Who is your favorite U.S. Supreme Court justice, and why? Mr. Burns. Um, so I think answered this question. Uh, this will be the third time now. Um, look, it's third good Marshall, and it's third good Marshall. Uh, because he didn't just think about the struggle, he lived the struggle, he fought the fight for civil rights in this country. <laughs> he lived that as a young man because of his circumstances, and he brought all of that to the court. And that is why his decisions and his voting record on that court are so magnificent, because he brought that background of living the struggle. Is it me? Judge okay. All right, I have two. And one is Sandra Day O'Connor and the other is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I respect and admire both of them um, for what they've done for women in our court and for what they've done to level the playing field for everyone in our country. Um, they both paved the way. I think for all of us, and we still are at a place where here in Wisconsin, only of all the judges, only one in five are women. Uh, but we're working hard to make sure to level that playing field, to have women at the table. And the kind of uh, adversity that they both had to go through to be where they were, and the decision making that stood up for the individual rights that we all hold dear here in our country, I respect and admire both of those women. I have great respect for Justice Anton and Scalia because of the work that he did over the course of decades to bring the judiciary, and he referred to it as the academy, our law schools, uh, back to an understanding of an appropriate view of the court's <coughs> role, uh, both in terms of uh, interpreting the Constitution based on its original public meaning, and importantly, in the work of statutory construction and interpretation. And he believes strongly that you begin uh, statutory interpretation with the text of the statute. And uh, that may not, hopefully, that doesn't seem too remarkable to the attorneys in the room today uh, because we followed that in Wisconsin for at least the last couple of decades. But I, I point back to Justice Scalia. He referred to his, uh, his canons of interpretation as what used to be orthodoxy. And by the time we got to the 1970s, it was no longer orthodoxy. And so he really worked hard over the course of years uh, to take people's attention back to those proper interpretive tools, and I believe that they are the right ones, and I appreciate his work in that area. Thank you, and as we get ready to close, I'm going to ask each candidate to give closing statements, two minutes long, we'll start with Burns. Is it two or one? Oh. One minute? 
closing? Sure. One minute from Katie, so there you go. <laughs> Thank you. So one of my opponents sit here, sits here today, Judge Dowd, and points out that I'm not a judge. That's right. I'm just a voter like most of you. First and foremost, I'll always be the kid who picked cherries for eight cents a pound in the summer alongside migrant farm workers and their families the kid who needed a scholarship to go to college. That's why I can no longer sit back and watch judges across the state and across the political spectrum hold themselves above working people and voters. I can no longer sit back and watch them refuse to be candid about their political values. Part of my French folks but it is bullshit. We have serious problems in this country. We are giving these judges powerful positions. We need to demand from them candor about their political values. Once again, I want to thank you all for being here today. I know you have other things you could have done during your lunch hour, and I appreciate your interest in this race. I do think this seat on the Supreme Court is very important because I believe it's critically important that our court does follow the rule of law, that when cases come before it, that the court simply does the legal research and goes where the law takes it and does not inject into the court's decision-making process uh, the individual justice's personal or political beliefs. And I believe that to my core. Now, that's my judicial philosophy, regardless which party is in control. It's up to the people to elect legislators and a governor who will set the policy that they want. It's up to those branches to set policy for the state. It's up to the court to determine whether or not they've overstepped a constitutional boundary. And if they have not, it's not the court's role to decide they made a bad choice. Now, a number of other people believe, agree with me that that's uh, the type of justice we want. I'm proud to have uh, the endorsement of a majority of our state's sheriffs, the Wisconsin Realtors Association, the Wisconsin Right to Life, Political Action Committee. All, those are three very different groups. They all understand we want judges who will simply interpret and apply the law. All right. What we've heard today really is one political figure saying one thing to appeal to the right, and, Ms. and Judge Scrinock uses hashtag Wisconsin right and had no problem setting aside the law when he wanted to block women's access to health care clinics, uh, not just peacefully protesting, but actually blocking their access. And the other one is designing to appeal to the far left, putting aside his representation of giant corporate America and picking out whatever he feels like fits into the rhetoric. Both would further politicize this race and they're both in it for the wrong reasons. I'm here because I believe in an independent judiciary. I'm not trying to achieve any kind of political goal and experience is what matters. I've been working in our courts for more than 20 years I've been a judge, I've been a prosecutor. I haven't always gotten it right in over 10,000 cases, but there's a reason that I was elected, that I was reelected, that I'm rated highly as a judge and have the support of over 200 judges across the state. Uh, and I teach other judges. It's because I know what I'm doing. And I want the, voters of, the votes of the people of Wisconsin because we need to return common sense to the bench. No more politics. Well, thank you, candidates.